Hi, this is uh, Day Miami, Bill Schmachtenberg. We're going to get started. Chrissy Claus, can you please silence your mic? Okay, thanks. Um, all right, so first of all, can everybody, can everyone hear me? that you want to bring up um, as we go along here. Again, that's fine. If you want to make a comment in voice, um, I'm happy to do that as well because I'll be honest, uh, this presentation, I, I hope, is going to be more of a discussion of uh, different types of emerging technologies. I'm going to share some of the research that I've been doing um, and some of the things I've been playing around with. But by all means, um, I'd like to also hear what, what you have to say. Um, so up there on the board, you see uh, my real life credentials and my contact in Second Life and my email address. I'm going to put that up again. Um, I check my email many times during the day. So if you need to get in touch with me, uh, feel free to, to contact me that way. All right. So I thought um, some of the things that I, I said uh, I want to uh, bring up today. Um, was new iOS apps. Uh, some of you know that I'm a licensed Apple developer, <clears throat> and I've been uh, giving some consideration as to what we can do with the uh, the new hardware, the, the new um, um, devices that Apple is coming up with. There's a new program called Fieldscapes that's going to be unveiled uh, this month uh, by Dane Limited. I've been working with uh, some students on Fourier analysis of fossils. I've I gave a lecture on that uh, last year as to what that was. I'm, I'm not going to go into as much details about that um, as I did a year ago, but we're getting some interesting results, both for research and also educational uh, a applications of that, um, that software. And then, like I said, um, you know, if you have any other topics that you want to discuss, I'll be happy to, uh, you know, to give up the floor, so to speak. All right, so one of the things that, um, that I've been considering um, is how much faster the processors are in uh, today's mobile devices. And this graph is a little bit hard to read, but it shows the CPU processors for the original iPhone um, in the lower left versus um, the um, iPhone 7, which was just released last year. Uh, Apple has increased the CPU processor speed by 240 times in the iPhone 7 as compared with the iPhone 1. And um, that's creating some amazing possibilities for developers um, such as myself in terms of what we can release in terms of mobile devices. Um, there's some apps that I thought would never run on a mobile device like an iPhone or an iPad, and I'm having to start to rethink that. In addition to um, faster processors, we've also got larger screen sizes, and, and this graphic shows how much um, that's increased from, uh, let's see, I believe the iPhone 4 uh, to the iPhone 6 Plus, which is uh, same screen resolution as the iPhone 7 Plus that was just released last year. Um, and with that much more real estate, we can get a lot more information and graphics on mobile devices um, to see what's going on. But to give you an example of what I'm talking about here, faster processors and bigger screens mean better apps. And if you look at the lower left-hand graphic, uh, this is a screenshot from, a, from an app I released two years ago called Ocean Explorer. <coughs> Excuse me. And, you know, the graphics weren't too bad. I had some fish swimming around. I had an underwater submarine. Um, but... Um, I really wanted to improve it, and there were a number of comments from end users that, um, yeah, it'd be really cool if, um, you know, we could add um, better graphics to it. So in the lower right, 
Um, I, this is a screenshot from Ocean Explorer 3, which is currently available on uh, the App Store. And uh, you notice uh, that you're dealing more with sort of a foggy environment that you get to explore around in. Um, the fish, I think, work better. Uh, we can do, instead of just um, a first-person experience, we, I put a diver in there and he swims around. And the functionality is better, too. So um, in Ocean Explorer 3, you can actually go up and down in the water column as well as swimming on the surface and underwater. Uh, none of that would have been possible um, a, a couple of years ago. Uh, Ocean Explorer 3 only runs... Um, really only want, runs on the latest Apple devices, iPhone 6 and 7, uh, because it really is taking advantage of the graphic processing power. So we can come up with, um, we can come up with a, a better sort of uh, experience, okay, for students to investigate science topics. All right, so that's, that's an example of what I mean by we can do, I think, better science, okay, with the better technology that's available today. All right, the, the second um, emerging technology I see it's coming out is uh, Fieldscapes. And um, Fieldscapes is a brand new program that uh, has been produced by the Dayton Limited Corporation in England. Uh, a good friend of mine, uh, David Burden, is working on it, um, he and his team. Um, they'll be announcing it, and the formal release is sometime this month. David is going to be speaking at uh, Virtual World's Best Practice in Education conference and um, giving a lot more details about the program. Um, and the idea behind Fieldscapes is simply this. Um, we, are, we all loved traditional real life, um, traditional real life uh, field trips. Um, but um, Fieldscapes goes beyond this. Fieldscapes allows you to create three-dimensional environments. Uh, Mike Shoy just asked, is it like Google Expeditions? Um, hold off one minute, uh, Mike, and I'll, I'm gonna tie that in. But let me explain what the concept behind Fieldscapes is. Um, what basically he says is this, we, we like going on real life field trips, but um, the problem with that is that you can't always do that. In some cases, it's just, there are logistical problems like Virginia Tech is brought up to me, you know, uh, if they're in Blacksburg in Southwest Virginia and they want to go to an area in Northern Virginia, that's a three-hour drive. Um, so you've got a long haul to get students up there. Maybe you only got a day, so that means you only have limited time to look around in a field area, and then you got to come back or you got to stay overnight. Um, there's a certain expense that's involved with it. Um, but um, the idea is with Fieldscapes, you just click in. You're in a virtual environment. I'm going to show you some examples in a minute. And you can have students uh, analyze data, collect, collect data, analyze it, um, answer questions, and so on. Um, day Limited is not in any way advocating that field trips, fieldscape should, it, should be substitute for real life field trips. They look at this as a way of preparing students to go in the field, give them a sort of three dimensional experience about what they're going to see before they get there. So there's a couple of ways, okay, that um, you could use this. Um, it's intended for mostly for earth science bio, but I think uh, other areas could use it. Astronomy, um, this would be useful. So um, here's an example of Catawba Mountain, which is one of the classic uh, fossil collecting areas in the Appalachians in Virginia. And um, Vic was asking about topographic maps. What I did was I went to the U.S. Geological Survey database and downloaded the elevation models for Catawba Mountain. And then I put it into Unity, and then what I do, what you do is you take Unity, you export an asset bundle, and you shoot that up to the the uh, ser the uh, servers at uh, Fieldscapes, and then you've got a three dimensional environment to run around in, and and you can texture the rocks on there, so you can get sort of a feel for what the environment is like, um, and you can put posters in there. Uh, when it, it's a little tricky getting the it can be a little tricky getting the landscapes in there. Uh, but once they're in there, um, you get this really nice editor that Fieldscapes has created for us where you can drop, they're called props, into this environment. And the props can be anything from posters that students would see when you first, um, you know, walking around. You can put multiple choice questions in there. Um, you can put equipment in there for, uh, for the students to use. 
Um, it's, it's a very rich environment to create in fieldscapes. Um, I'm here in Virginia in the United States, so of course, multiple choice standardized testing is all the rage. And Data Limited, of course, provides us with the ability to put multiple choice questions in there as you're running around. But more importantly, and not a lot of companies are doing this, when students are going around and they answer the questions, if they get it wrong, they get customized feedback to that specific question. Um, so if they're doing fine, you know, they just move right along. Um, if they're having problems, they'll, they'll get help within the Fieldscape environment. Um, all right, so what do I see as the advantages to Fieldscapes? Um, when I look at current standardized testing that's going on here in the United States, it's just, you know, you're sitting at the screen and you get these black and white multiple choice questions of content that's really not related to any sort of real life data or problem solving. It's just they're testing students on a bunch of facts. Vealscapes allows you to integrate real world spatial data into problem solving. Um, you can look at three dimensional spatial relationships, which are so important in areas like geology and astronomy. Um, you constantly get feedback to the students. This is a formative approach rather than a punitive approach currently used in assessments. And the, and the learning could be scaffolded. I showed Fieldscapes to the chairman of the science department and a principal at the school that I teach at. And one of the things that they really loved was that you can start with very simple concepts, whether it's geology or any other science. And as the student answers the questions, Fieldscapes will make the analysis progressively more difficult and more complex, especially when you're dealing with the geology of Virginia, which is complex to begin with. So you can start with something similar and get more complex, and you can lead the student both spatially and in terms of conceptually to go from simple ideas to a much more complete analysis of an area. Um, that's what they call scaffolding in education. I really love the approach, and Day Limited has made that so simple. Um, another thing that's really cool about Fieldscapes is that you get some functionality that you get in Second Life. So you don't have to walk around the environment like many multiplayer uh, worlds. You can fly around like in Second Life, which makes it so easy to go from one spot to another. Uh, okay, 8-Bit uh, is saying if it doesn't prepare them for the standardized test, we'll have less chance of adaptation. It's a fine line to walk. Um, well, I would, what I would say to that is, yes, I'm, I am a high school teacher in Virginia. That's my day job. So you're right. My job is to make sure my students pass the standardized test at the end of this semester, which will be in May. I, I get that, and the principals say that as well. But now let's talk philosophically. If you look at the spirit of the science SOLs that are in my state and in many other states, the focus is clearly, clearly on data analysis, data interpretation, and inquiry learning. And that is not being accomplished by today's assessments. So I'm going to make the argument here and now, and I'm not the only one that's saying this, there are a lot of other people that are tooting this horn, that the assessments that Pearson is putting out, that we're being used in our schools, has got to adapt, especially in the sciences. All right? um, and more and more people realize this. When I talk to experts at the Department of Education, they're going, well, of course, the assessment doesn't match the current standards. So my question to you all is, are we supposed to be preparing students for a test that is based on unrealistic assumptions, or should we be aiming them array for doing science, inquiring data analysis, and so on? And that's what I love, Fieldscapes. Um, it is, I think, the next approach in terms of, of you know, getting students to, to see what they know. Um, let's see, uh, Vic brought up um, about the Open University does a virtual field trip to the Lake District, and he is absolutely right. Uh, Dayton Limited um, worked with Dr. Shaley Minaka and the Open University. They were developers for this, well, it's, it's, they pronounce it Skittle like the candy. Um, actually, it's pronounced Skidaw, that's why S-K-I-D-A-W. They're an excellent company. Okay, and producing really nice um, virtual field trip environments. Uh, I wonder how far behind, anyway, we're going too fast. I wonder how far behind science standards are the state of the practice, which you are showing us. That's great. Thanks, Vic. All right. Um, 
and Decade Pierce will be offering all of these 3D experience part of their textbook packages. Oh, that's good to have. Have you heard from Pierce and Mike? Because I haven't heard any of this about um, a 3D experience, but I really think they should do that. All right. Um, the next thing I wanted to point out is uh, that the nice thing about fieldscapes is that it's not just Virginia. Um, they're uh, the Day Limited are putting up um, field areas from England. I've got Virginia. I'm working with Marion Helberg. We're trying to create one for uh, Sweden. So the beauty of this is with a few clicks of a mouse, a student could go from one area to another um, and look at and maybe do comparisons of the different geology that's going on. Uh, we're getting more. OK. Um, the other thing that's nice about fieldscapes is that you can put equipment like uh, clinometers, tape measures and so on. So you can do actual measurements as just as if you were in the field, either to prepare students to use that equipment on actual field trips or, um, you know, for them to do measurements within this virtual environment. Uh, you could do field trips to the moon or Mars. We've got a couple of fieldscapes in there as well. All right, before I go on to the next one, um, I want to go back to what um, Mike or Vic was saying earlier about um, how do how does fieldscapes tie into Google Expeditions? Um, I will say this, uh, fieldscapes, um, they are working on a VR integration into this. Um, I haven't heard too much about Google Cardboard yet, but I think they're going to support that. Um, also, I know they're looking for support for Oculus Rift. So how cool would that be to do virtual field trips uh, within an, an Oculus environment? Um, again, Dave Limited told me that there's going to be support uh, for this. So anyway, if you just if you want to know more, um, Google Fieldscapes and Dave Limited, and you know you'll the the website will immediately pop up. If you want to get an account, um, there's no charge for you to go in there and and sign up for a free account, and then. Um, there's a whole bunch of field trips that you can play around with and get a better feel for um, what this is able to do. But I think it's a very interesting, exciting possibility that Dayton Limited is going to be doing. And again, um, if you're coming to Virtual's Best Practice in Education, um, David Byrne will be speaking there and, and he can probably answer your questions better than I can. <clears throat> All right, so like I said last year, um, I mentioned to you that I'm working on a computer program, and the objective of it is to uh, be able to identify a fossil down to the species level and determine its geologic age within a few minutes. Um, this is a problem that I've faced for years at both um, the high school level, the college level, when I try and teach my students. Um, I just finished uh, using this at uh, the high school in Southwest Virginia. Um, the state wants students to use fossils to get uh, the geologic age of rocks. And my comment has been, well, that's a nice uh, goal, but it, it, to actually do it in practice takes weeks, months. I have a whole class, I do it firm um, on that. And even so, the students try to struggle. So anyway, here's what the program that I came up with Basically, what you do is you um, can import a picture or you can use one of the ones that I've got on my website. You bring it in, you take some measurements on it. Um, the software includes several parts. You have to specify the scale um, on the fossil. Uh, it has a built-in digitizer. So once you specify the scale, you can quickly and easily get a series of radial measurements um, from the beak. Uh, if you're doing, for example, brachiopods. Um, the Fourier analysis basically will reduce the shape of the shell to a new few numbers, um, typically the average radius and a few harmonics. So basically what you're doing is, if we go back a slide here and we take a look at this trilobite um, head, um, what the program is doing is it fits um, a circle, or in this case a semicircle, to the shape of the shell. Um, the radius of which is equal to the average radius that's measured here. And then what it does, it uses cosine functions to sort of bulge the shape out until you get a nice fit. Um, the red and white line that you're seeing there 
Um, well, the red line is what the computer thinks the shape of the shell looks like. And then if you look carefully, there's a white line there uh, that shows where I actually click that shows the exact shape. So you get a, a visual feedback as to how well it's working. Um, and then there's a built-in database of known fossils um, that you compare the average radius and harmonics of the unknown one. Um, it just goes through the database and um, picks uh, using uh, Euclidean distance measurements um, which fossil matches up best to the unknown. And it works pretty well. Um, I just used the program at my high school. We had 70 students go to the computer lab and use the fossil app on a Friday. I gave them 13 unknown, typical unknown fossils from the state of Virginia. In an hour, they were average. Uh, they were able to identify 10 of the 13 fossils to an accuracy of 79%. That ain't bad. That's not bad considering they had no formal training in paleontology, okay, before um, they did it. And the good news is they're improving. They're getting better because last year when I did this analysis, um, the score was um, 8 out of the 13 in an hour at about the same accuracy level. Uh, right, Vic, this is a Fourier transform. It's a finite Fourier um, polar coordinate analysis of the data. Uh, and of I don't go into that, although for most students, but what's interesting is um, uh, I have had several high school students, freshmen that get so interested in the math that they want to do it on their own. Um, and I've had them sit down on paper and pencil and, and do all the math the computer is doing. So... To me, this is a STEM-based approach to uh, the earth science, which has not been used. Um, you know, the students can um, the student can um, come up with an objective identification, and then you can test it against other field data. In some cases, we know exactly where the fossil was collected. We know the actual age to begin with. Right. I talked about this um, last year and gave more of the details of how this works. Um, it's on my website. I'll put this in local chat if any of you want to play around with this. Uh, if you just go to that website and click on the free fossil app link, um, it's got instructions on how to use it. There's three versions of it. There's one for K-12, which is very simple. It's only eight fossils. You don't really need to know much about fossils. There's one for a college level where the students would have to know the different types of fossils. And then there's one for the university level where you can import um, any fossil you want and run through the analysis. So um, check it out. All right, uh, last fall, I used this app at my, in my paleontology class at Ferrum College. And I saw an amazing increase uh, what I did was I brought the students into the class. I taught them about the types of fossils. We discussed uh, morphologic features and so on. And towards about the middle of the class, I give them a huge lab where I lay out, I think it was about 15 different unknown fossils. And I said, all right, I want you to identify them as far down as you can. You may use your lab manuals. You may work together on this. And the traditional approach failed miserably. The results of that lab were 17 percent. My best students were scoring 40s and 50s. Uh, it just clearly wasn't working. So then I said, okay, let's try the app. And um, the scores immediately jumped up to 90 percent. Uh, it was a much bigger improvement than I saw in a previous year. So, so I'm getting really great results both at the high school and the college level. All right, plus we've got some students now, this is a new wrinkle. Um, some of you may know I'm a research associate at the Virginia Museum of Natural History in Martinsville, uh, Virginia. And we're going through and we're organizing uh, the collections that are there for the Paleozoic. We've got fossil specimens from 540 million years ago to about 240 million years ago. And when we went through and we were organizing some of the specimens, many of which, most of this came from Virginia Tech, um, there was a couple of trays of fossils that we knew the age, we knew the rocks they came from, um, but um, we did not, they weren't identified. Um, right, this is, these fossils came from uh, the Benbolt Formation in Southwest Virginia. Um, so I, I had a couple of students 
uh, who expressed an interest in uh, working with me to try and identify it. Um, so these kids are getting practical experience with actual museum collections. And one of the things that I told them that's really exciting is that their identifications will stick. You know, I'm going to work with them and, and clear it up, but they're doing a great job. So here's one of, the, one of my students uh, working at the computer with my fossil app um, uh, to uh, examine one of the unknown fossils from uh, the museum. And uh, we have several of them uh, actually went to the museum uh, to look at the actual specimens uh, and include some traditional measurements. One of the things uh, I'm working with uh, Virginia Tech and the Department of Mines, no, Virginia Tech and James Madison University, both universities are very interested in this app. Um, and paleontologists there have told me that they don't want this to just be based on the picture of the picture of the fossil and some measurements. Um, they want uh, traditional uh, other uh, information to be included in there, um, various features of these, say, surface features of the shells. So that's what these students are doing is they're taking some traditional measurements and they are going to, to um, include that in the analysis. Uh, I don't know if you can read it though, but one of the things that's, one of the results we got was I went through the specimens and sort of did a uh, tentative identification of the fossils, and then I asked the students to use my app and see what they would come up with. And the students did pretty well. Um, they got 30, I thought they identified 30% of the unknown specimens correctly. Um, and the takeaway that I got from it was that the students did a pretty good job using the app. The problem really was the quality of the preservation of the material. The specimens that were best preserved were the ones that I was sure I identified correctly and were also the ones that the students identified correctly. The ones that didn't come up very well were the ones that weren't preserved well at all. Um, so that's part of an issue. Obviously, uh, for example, if you go know, back and you think about that this technique is very strongly influenced by the shape of the outer part of the shell, if that's broken, that can create some problems. Uh, I find most fossils you know, you are, are good enough that you can identify in this way. Um, so what we're doing now is I'm having the students go through and I've adjusted the software so that they can include some traditional measurements as well as the doing the Fourier analysis. And what it'll do is the traditional measurements will go through and filter the database. So if for example, if they think uh, there's a certain characteristic of the shell that's important, like maybe the fold of the sulcus on the shell, they can only go through the database and find those specimens um, that have that particular feature and then run the Fourier analysis about it. All right, and that's it. All right, so we have plenty of time here um, to discuss other topics in technology and um, science. I haven't touched much at all on Oculus Rift, HTC Vive, Google Cardboard. Um, uh, the latest issue of Veg Virtual Educators Journal has a great article by uh, Vasily, one of my friends, on the future of Google Cardboard. And if you haven't read that, um, it's, it's well worth your time. Uh, right at the beginning, he talks about uh, Mars 2030, an app released by NASA. Um, and I download it and had a great time. Uh, you're sitting on the Martian surface and it talks about future Mars colonies. Um, so if, just go on the App Store and uh, search for Mars 2030 if you've got a Google Cardboard device and um, you know and you can and you can try that out yourself. All right so. All right, Vic just, you know, uh, yeah, Vic just put in an article about Virginia Tech and some of the work that they're doing. So does anybody have any questions? Or like I said, I'd like your feedback at this point. I know we normally spend an hour, and this is the way that I like to do my presentations. I, I don't like to lecture for the entire time period. I want to give uh, you guys some time to uh, talk about some of the things that you're working on or ideas that you have. So again, um, just put some, uh, I know we've already had some questions and comments in uh, local chat, but uh, if there are other things that you're thinking about, then 
then feel free to uh, to type that in, or if you want to uh, take over the mic, I'll be happy to share it with you as well. All right, and I guess you're still thinking. All right, put this up. Cal, still thinking. All right, let me throw this out here. Um, how many of you are working uh, or thinking at all about Oculus Rift or HTC Vive virtual reality? Haven't talked much about that other than Fieldscapes. Is there anybody that has a per okay in terms of? Um, well, uh, let's see. All right, Mike says he's mostly doing Google Cardboard. And of course, Google Cardboard is the one that's going to be most popular in schools because not only is virtual reality, but there's a low cost that's associated with it. Um, and Google Maps, Google Expeditions are all uses of it. Um, when you get into HTC Vive and Oculus Rift, um, the expense goes way up. But I think there's some advantages that you get for that. Um, we are, I am working on an Oculus Rift. Uh, we just got approved. We got a grant and we got a fast enough computer that can run one of those virtual headsets. Um, we got that set up about a month ago. It's got a 3.4 gigahertz i7 processor. Um, I think it's got the 1060 GLC NVIDIA card, 32 gigs of RAM. So it's a real monster. Um, and then we're working on probably by this fall getting, I'd like to get an Oculus Rift headset to run on it. Um, and yeah, and uh, we're going to try um, some of the different um, software that's out there. I know Mars 2030 will run not only on Google Cardboard, but Oculus Rift. So that's probably the first program we'd want to run on that. And it's been... Um, I know it's on one of the stores, whether it's Steam or um, so it might be Microsoft Office Store. Okay, let's see. Hafing is saying, I've been on a virtual tour of Chernobyl versus Oculus Rift on a comp. Oh, interesting use of the technology. One of the things I did, I was at the, um, I've been at the, uh, I went to an ISTE conference uh, 2015, and NASA was there, and they did a very interesting uh, application of uh, Oculus Rift, where basically you were in a theater, you had the, the headset on, and you got the the sort of perspective of the seats and so on, and there was a countdown, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, so on. When it hit one, rocket ship launches, and it's the scene cuts to where you're floating above the Earth, and it was a very immersive experience. It was like you look down and the earth is beneath you. And then you look in front of you and there's a satellite. And when I leaned forward, my head went right through the, the bulkhead of the satellite. But the most unnerving thing was it, the, the, it was so immersive that my senses were fooled. I felt like I was falling in space. And I actually, I had to, my brain, I said, no, I'm in a conference at a conference, and I put my hands out to break myself. And Mike's saying, I'm very happy to be up here about Fieldscapes, reinventing the wheel for the chem demo. Sure. Um, Mike, definitely go to, like I said, go to the Dayton Limited site. Let me see if I can pull it up here, and I'll put the, I'll put the website in again. By the way, there's my email address if you didn't go at the um Get it at the beginning of the presentation.
Okay, there's the uh, there is the uh, website for those of you that want to go, and it even has a an, a YouTube video of the Skittle region in England that uh, we were talking about earlier. Oh, that would be cool, Vic. We don't have anything for Texas yet, and um, so we'd love to expand this out. And you've got the U.S. Geological Survey data to, to deal with. And um, one of the technicians I've been working with is a guy named Nash at um, Dayton Limited, and he's very good at, at offering advice. So definitely, Vic, yeah, if you've got um, any particular part of Texas, because I've been down there. I've been to West Texas, haven't done much to the east, but I've been to the Solitario Dome, and, and you're right, there's some great places in Texas to explore. So I think Dave would be very interested if you wanted to come up with a, uh, a fieldscape for, for Texas. That's interesting, Mike. A potential energy surface. Yeah, I mean, um, that's an interesting idea. I never thought about expanding this um, into, um, you know, other than landscapes. Of course, fieldscapes is designed for landscapes, but at any sort of three-dimensional surface, um, you could actually put avatars on them and have it run around. Um, if you go to Dayton's website, they've got some other uh, tools at their um, on their website about data analysis that Mike you might be interested in. Vic or Mike, if you want the um, if you want to speak in voice, that's fine with me. I'll turn mic off, my mic off if you want to share some ideas. Otherwise, we can just keep using local text. Yes, and so how many of you went to the Linden Labs? I think it was the last Virtual Worlds Best Practice in Education. They talked about Sansar, and from what I've heard, it's not going to be like Second Life. Uh, it's going to be more like Unity, where you create a virtual environment offline, and then you upload it to the Sansar servers for people to explore with. That's fine. Name of what tagline? Oh, Sansar. By the way, for those of you who don't know, Virtual World's Best Practice in Education is scheduled for March 29th to April 1st. So it runs from a Wednesday to a Saturday, which is typically uh, when they do that conference. Does anybody know if the cat the program has come out for that yet? Because I know they were they were working on it. 
Jess, are, is Science Circle going to have a booth there or? Okay, Wisdom Seeker, do you have a link to it? Because I heard it was supposed to come out. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Vic. Um, 8 bit, we haven't talked much about the biology part of Fieldscapes, but you, I know you mentioned that you didn't do a lot with real life um, field trips. What do you think about the potential for using Fieldscapes? Because it doesn't, the, the software is set up, you can put any content you want in there. Um, when you, Once you create the landscape and Fieldscapes, of course, I'm a geologist, so I put a lot of geology content in there. But the questions could also include about marine, about organisms. Um, it doesn't even have to be science. You could do a fieldscape with history information. If, for example, I was to create a fieldscape for um, famous Civil War sites here in Virginia and talked about uh, the North versus the South, I know they're thinking of putting in sites from England that way as well. Uh, for fieldscapes, um, it's there's not a lot of, of firepower you need to run fieldscapes. Um, the computers that we have at my school are pretty bottom of the line HPs. Um, they don't have dedicated video cards in them. They have the regular Intel video cards. Um, I don't even know what kind of process they've got in them, but they, they run fieldscapes just fine. Um, my work computer that I have here. You don't need to have a, a serious game and rig to do uh, fieldscapes. Should be able to, yes. That's, that's what we're working on. Right now, um, last week, what I'm working with tech services on is to get um, is to get the fieldscapes installed on the, uh, the computers in the computer lab at my school. Uh, because what I want to do is a formal study of how well this helps um, in the traditional classroom. So my plan uh, proceeding forward is to do like a pre-test, take students up there, have them run through fieldscapes, and then test them again. Thanks, Wisdom Seeker. Yeah, Vic, that's uh, Virginia Museum of Natural History is the place where I've been doing the work with the, the Fourier analysis of the fossils. And I just went to the Virtual World's Best Practice in Education site, and I don't see a program on there. 8-bit, um, do you teach biology and at what level? Oh, nice. Yeah, we should talk. Uh, it's interesting that you do both earth science and uh, biology. Are you retired now? You said did for eight years. Uh, yeah, in, in Virginia, you have to specialize. 
I've got a general science certificate, but I could do middle school science teaching, but uh, they specialize bio versus chemistry, physics, and earth science. Oh, sorry to hear that. Oh, wow, that sounds like a great job. A friend of mine did uh, some three-dimensional modeling of a nursing sim, Kevin Tweedy for Duke University years back. Right, yeah, that was, <laughs> well, all right, I'll say a little bit about that tagline since you brought it up. Um, I haven't had a lot of students that want to do the Fourier analysis on paper and pencil, but I did have a couple of them uh, try, try it. The first student that did it went home and was working on the math, ran into a problem, came into school, went to a math teacher and showed it to a math teacher, had no clue what she was doing. Because Fourier analysis is not the sort of thing you normally teach in high school or even in college-level calculus classes. It's more considered um, an engineering form of math. Um, I only found out about it through a professional journal article and thought it was really cool and, and looked into it. Um, so I said to her, yeah, come to me. The math teachers normally aren't trained in something like this. Yeah, and and the other thing I didn't tell you was the uh, the two students who took the time and trouble to actually work their way through um, the Fourier analysis were not guys; they were girls. And you know, so when I hear "oh, ladies, they don't want to go into STEM," <laughs> not true. I mean, there are there are young female students that are out there. Um, that are very interested in advanced math and engineering and that sort of thing. Yeah, some of the kids do some very interesting work. And we had a uh, AP night, it was a couple of years ago, where the students were clearly playing around with wave phenomena. I saw some students that night that were taking musical instruments and hooking them up to oscilloscopes, and they were actually looking at the, um, the oscillation of the waves from a guitar or a drum. I saw another one that went to a chemistry lab where they did the experiment where they took a long pipe and they ran a gas through it and they had openings in the in the uh, in the top of the pipe, and again, they use sound waves to control the the uh, the production of the flame coming out of the tubes, and all those would just be perfect for doing Fourier analysis on to understand how you know basically sounds are just a series of oscillating waves, okay, that are combined in different ways, and I don't think the math is that hard. I mean, you can reduce it so that so that students can understand it.
Oh, nice. Okay, we're we're we got about five minutes left. Um, sure, thanks, no problem, Vic. Thanks for coming. I appreciate the feedback. Um, does anybody else have any other comments? Otherwise, we'll wrap it up. Um, and Vic and Mike, I'll let uh, David know that you're interested in field skips, fieldscapes. Um, if anybody else is interested in that, let me know. You've got my email. Just send it to me. Yeah, I think I've already got yours, uh, Vic, as I recall. And Mike gave me his. Yes, I've already got you in my in my virtual Rolodex here. Thanks, tagline. Yeah, that's the beauty of Second Life. 